there is a extraordinary, revolutionary, utterly startling phrase in the Course in Miracles, and it's this, you are irreplaceable in the mind of God. Actually, I ought to stop there. <laughs> I should stop there and we should have 20 minute silence just to really think about that. What would it mean? You. And it doesn't say some of you or those of you I like best or those of you who look most like the so-called ideals. No. It's an unconditional collective you that is also intensely personal. You are irreplaceable in the mind of God. And when I was listening to Walter's beautiful call to uh, abundant gratitude and abundant praise, which was every bit as wonderful as I knew it would be, I was reminded also of my journey across the southern states of the United States in 1995, which is when I first met Liz, our wonderful singing Liz. We met on that journey. And one of the things that we observed in those largely black congregations, Baptist congregations mostly, in uh, Louisiana and Tennessee and Alabama, was that people were very abundant in their praising. So if you had liked Walter's talk as much as I did, for example, you would be saying, yes, hear it again, enjoy. Thank you, thank you God, thank you brother. But we, of course, are differently conditioned. We're very differently conditioned. We let a little flicker come up in the heart, don't we? We let a little, you know, our heads nod and, you know, we might smile, but we don't exude our exuberance. And yet, that is what the call to abundance is. Not necessarily to express it in that particular way, but not either to inhibit what is beautiful within us. Not either to dwell in a dreary, boring, and sometimes utterly depressing way with all that is going wrong, with all that is somehow not perfect, and giving that the right to colonize our minds and our thinking and our speech. How much of our speech is praising? How much of our speech is abundant in appreciation? The phrase that I have particularly been working with is, I have everything I need. <gasps> oh, of course, the ego mind, the little ego mind, rushes to remind you at once of all the things you don't have. But mostly those are things you want, rather than the things you need. Truly, if I have learned anything from these last 30 years, and some things I have had to learn over and over again because I have been so slow, I have learned that if only I have the courage, the patience, and the restraint to pause and remember, I do indeed have everything I need. And what's more, that my reminders of this, my experience of it, and my revelations of it will only come when my need is great. When everything is bobsy die, we don't need to think about what we truly need. I've also been reading a particular favorite chapter in the Christian Gospels. It's Matthew chapter 6. I find a lot in Matthew more generally, but this is a very particular one. And we 
we often look towards our Buddhist brothers and sisters and our Buddhist texts for some psychological wisdom, and so we should. There is so much to be gained from that direction. But we can also get a great deal of psychological and social wisdom from the Christian Gospels. In Matthew, we are invited to obsess far less about material possessions that so preoccupy us in 21st century life, that are kind of the locus of so much of our anxiety and our fretting. And 2,000 years ago, we were reminded that moths and insects can eat most of what we highly value, or thieves can take them. But what we build up on the inside and give away and give away and give away ever more freely isn't available to moths and insects and is not either available to thieves because it is ours to give and we can give it generously. And there's a very telling phrase in Matthew, what you treasure, there your heart will be also. In other words, and this is something that I've written about a lot in my books, what you pay most attention to will grow stronger in your life. If 99.9% .9 of your thoughts are around your material, external possessions, then you are starving your inner world of your spiritual knowledge, of your spiritual treasures, which will be with you as they have been with you throughout eternity, remembering that eternity doesn't begin from now. Eternity also always was. So you've had those treasures for a very long time, and all you have to do is remember. In fact, says the Gospel, don't let yourself be torn between inner and outer values. Hold to those inner values and let those be the values you express. And sometimes it's said, don't be torn between God and mammon, really between the sacred and what limits us. And this teaching goes on, again, in a very beautiful way. Therefore, I tell you, don't be nearly so anxious about your life. And is there a soul in this church who hasn't got first-hand knowledge of what it means to be anxious? To wake up at three in the morning, dwelling on a situation where the outcome is unknown to you and where you have so much concern and worry. And are you in that moment turning in and asking not only for the strength that you need, but also for the strength that the situation needs. That is your inner treasure, that you can do that, and that it doesn't depend on faith. It depends on remembering. Nor, says the Gospel, should you worry quite so much about your body and what you will wear. That's good too, isn't it? Isn't your life about something more than food and what you wear? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, nor churches nor temples. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more than they learn from the lilies of the field? See how naturally they grow without weaving their garment. I tell you, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as one of these. So, says the Gospel, let your anxieties go. Or can you? Could you dare to trust your inner treasures enough 
to let your anxieties go. And in a very real sense, hand them over. Even if you have no real sense of who or what or how you are handing them over or who will receive them. But you are handing them to a greater energy than your everyday mind understands or could know. Be aware of a sacred vision of life, says this same teaching. And that's why you're here. That's why you come third Sundays of the month. To have your sacred vision of life affirmed. To have your sense of abundance affirmed. To be reminded of your great beauty and resources and resilience even when they are not immediately familiar to you. This also brings you, in a very profound and meaningful way, into the present moment. So much of our anxiety takes us away from the present moment. It hurtles us into a future that hasn't come, but feels fearful, or it regrets something in the past. In the present moment, we have what we need. We can ask what is needed now. I write about this at Seeking the Sacred. What is needed now? What is needed now for me more to be, to be more in harmony with my circumstances? What is needed now for me to be a peacemaker when I feel agitated? What is needed now for me to calm my mind? What is needed now for me to open my heart? What is needed now for me to accept the unacceptable? And in a different passage, but again, also from the Christian Bible. You are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Don't use that freedom to think only about yourselves. For the sake of love, care for one another. So in asking this vital question, what is needed now, we are never asking it for our own personal sake only. We are also asking it on behalf of everyone whom our lives touch. May these words benefit us and all those whom our lives touch. Because every day, consciously and unconsciously, our words, our attitudes, our actions, our gestures, our bodies, our, our everything, the way we work, the way we play, the way we think, the way we eat, the way we walk on this earth affects those with whom we are sharing this extraordinary gift of existence. And now I'm going to read you another passage. This is also a passage that was inspired by the Course in Miracles. And sometimes it's attributed to Nelson Mandela, but in fact it was written by Marianne Williamson in a book called A Return to Love. And she learned this very deeply and powerfully from A Course in Miracles. Because each time we turn from the temptations of measuring ourselves only against the the cynical, the limited, and the limiting. We are failing to love. And each time we return to our true sacred inheritance, we are returning to love. So this is what she wrote, and it will be familiar to many of you. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light 
not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. And don't they, until we teach them that they may not. All children shine. We were born, says Marian Williamson, to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us, it is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. It's a beautiful teaching. It's a really powerful teaching, and I think most of us would need to read it again and again and again because it so strongly defies the social conditioning that you've had for however long you've been in this body. So this is my prayer today. May we be brave enough May we be bold enough, may we be daring enough and perhaps even needy enough to claim our greatness, which is no more and no less ours than the beauty of the lily, the swiftness of the birds and the glories of nature. As the teachings in Matthew's Gospel insist we understand and take to heart and live and embody our inner glory, our soul strengths, our inner glory, yours, mine, ours, is radiant, is resilient, is hopeful, is gentle, is strong, is subtle, is forgiving and evolving, and always, always available. We have only to remember Listen to me.